Hey, good morning, everyone. This is another Saturday morning teaching on our Clear Mountain Monastery YouTube channel. Hope everyone is doing well, having a good Saturday morning. Uh, today, we will be finishing up our series on uh, abandoning, uh, finishing up our series on the second discourse from the Majjhima Nikaya, the Sabhasava Sutta. And as usual, the format for today's, uh, today's study, today's uh, hopefully conversation will be, I'll give some thoughts based on various points in this discourse, and then uh, maybe do that for about half an hour or so. And then we'll have 15 minutes for questions. So. Uh, anyone who's so inclined can post questions in the chat box on YouTube uh, and I'll get those and we'll answer them by and by. So we can jump right in after this uh, formal invocation, which we do traditionally at the beginning of a Dhamma talk. Namo tasa bhagavato arahato sama sambuddhasa Namo dasa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa Namo dasa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa Buddhang dhammang sanghang namasami Okay. So, for anyone who's been following along, we're going over the second discourse in the Majjhima Nikaya, the Sabhasava Sutta. And this discourse outlines a very broad range of practice, a very uh, expansive conception of what it means to, to practice in uh, the Buddhist context. Many people come to Buddhism and they think it's just a technique. They think the Buddha taught the one-fold path, the Buddha just taught meditation. We're just one trick ponies, one trick monks. All we do is just meditate. Um, all a practitioner needs to do is just, just meditate, just close their eyes and uh, look inwards. Uh, but this discourse gives a, a number of practices. Um, I don't think by all means the uh, complete array of disciplines and ways of training the heart that the Buddha uh, expounded throughout the whole of the Tipitaka. Uh, but he did, in this sutta, really give um, a greater range than most of us are used to. In fact, he framed it in terms of abandoning. So seven different types of abandoning are mentioned. And abandoning what? I mean, is this talking about like abandoning our kids or abandoning our, our work or abandoning um, what? What are, we, what are we hoping to abandon? And the answer is the asavas. So the name of the discourse is the sub-asava sutta. Uh, Sabha is all, asava is effluence or outflows or inflows or uh, basically taints is another translation or the hindrances or basically these are blemishes of the mind. Uh, they are the way that the mind goes out the way that the, the heart kind of leaks, leaks out of our uh, eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body, and mind, and really just uh, becomes disconnected from, from a heart, from the present moment. So that's what an asava is, and these are ways of abandoning those asavas. Uh, and the asavas are uh, umbrella terms. They're all expansing wide gauge terms. Um, Traditionally, they're spoken of as three asavas. You've got the asava of craving, so the taints or the leakages which go in the direction of sensuality. We see beautiful things and we want them. We see things we don't like and we hate them. Um, there's the uh, asavas of becoming or bhava, and that's when we basically just proliferate. We've got some idea about who we want to be or uh, what we're doing or what we have to do or what we did do, etc. These are the asavas, the taints, the hindrances, 
the leakages, the mind uh, sewers of, of becoming. And then uh, ditti or views, these are uh, the ways that we latch on to particular uh, thoughts and then just run with it and think only this is true and everything else is wrong. That's uh, one expression of uh, the asavas of view. And how do we abandon these? Seven ways. Uh, we abandon them by seeing. Yeah, so we, we see this process of complication, this process of stain making. We, we see the stains, we see the, the blemishes of the heart. And when we see them in the present moment, then we can cease the action that we're doing, the things that we're doing to uh, contribute to that. So uh, those are the asavas to be abandoned by seeing. They're the asavas to be abandoned by restraining. This is defined as uh, restraining the eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body, and mind. So uh, rather than just look at anything or rather than uh, paying attention to um, certain aspects of our visual field or the auditory field or our sense of taste and smell uh, or, or even our thoughts, rather than paying attention to those aspects which would lead to craving and aversion, uh, rather than doing that, we stay internal. Uh, we don't go out in the direction of uh, yeah, craving and, and aversion. There are the asavas to be abandoned by using. So that's using the requisites of uh, our clothing, our shelters, our food, and the medicines that we use. And if we're intelligent in our use of these things, then uh, there's no, no reason and no cause to uh, we, yeah, we won't, we won't suffer if we're intelligent, you, intelligently using these things. Then there are the asavas to be abandoned by uh, avoiding. We talked about this last week, and those are the things like uh, on a course level, it's avoiding um, such things like a wild horse or a wild dog or in modern times uh, we're not going around running in traffic um, on a more close level these are yeah um, associates or friends or non-friends who just give rise to uh, things which we don't want to cultivate in the heart so we we avoid uh, to the extent that we can to the extent that um, it's intelligent and helping our path. We avoid such things. Then there are the asavas to be abandoned by destroying. So that's not talking about destroying external things. It's talking about destroying uh, obstructive mental states. So destroying thoughts of sensuality, destroying thoughts of ill will, destroying thoughts of harming. Those three ways of thinking, we want to let them go. And uh, the Buddha spoke in a rather strong manner of destroying. You see these things come up and uh, yeah, you work for their non-continuance because yeah, these lead to complication and um, yeah, they kind of go in a, a dark, dark direction. They can. So, and then the following and the fi uh, final way of abandoning is through developing, uh, through bhavana, bhavana. And that's what will be the major um, topic for this week's discussion. Um, so this term bhavana is a very useful, very useful term to, to know. I imagine most people who are tuning in, I have already learned some poly words. Yeah. I mean, some poly words have made it into normal English vocabulary. I believe the word nirvana, which is a Sanskrit word for the Pali Nibbana, is in the Oxford English Dictionary, uh, the Buddha, the Dharma, uh, I believe even the Sangha. So these major words have made it into the English uh, word usage pool. 
but then there are other words which we're not yet familiar with, and bhavana might be one of these. Uh, it's quite useful to know because it's the word which is often translated as meditation. So this is the way of abandoning through meditation, bhavana. Um, and that is one aspect of uh, the English word, what we think of when we say and use this word bhavana uh, in English, or I'm sorry, this, this word meditation in English, it does include, um, uh, it's, it's mostly relating to what we do when our, 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 our eyes are closed. Yeah, we sit and meditate. We've got a special spot in our in our homes, a special spot in our rooms. We've got a special posture that we take on. We close our eyes, and for many people, that's what meditation is. But that is not the whole of what bhavana is. Uh, bhavana is a de-verbal noun. So this is a noun which comes from a verb. So most nouns in Pali do come from verbs. Um, in this case, the root verb, which the term bhavana comes from, is bu. Um, and the normal uh, uh, the normal verb for this is bhavati, um, which literally means just to be or to exist um, or to become. Um, but this, this term bhavana, has a long A, the first A, and it's from the causative form of bhavati, which is bhaveti with a long A. And so this shifts the meaning from means simply uh, what exists to what we cause to exist. So bhavana is that which we cause to exist. It is uh, maybe a better translation in meditation would be development. Uh, Bhavana is development, those things which we develop. It's not just, it's not just meditation. Uh, the formal definition for uh, what it means to abandon by developing as it occurs in the Sabhasava Sutta is as follows. So what are the asavas, the taints, to be abandoned by developing? There's the case where a monk or practitioner reflect, reflecting appropriately develops mindfulness or sati as a factor for awakening dependent on seclusion dispassion cessation and resulting in letting go they develop analysis of qualities that is dhamma vichya as a factor for awakening they develop persistence as a factor of awakening that is virya they develop rapture or pity as a factor of awakening. They develop serenity or pasadi as a factor of awakening. They develop concentration or samadhi as a factor of awakening. And they develop equanimity as a factor for awakening. And this factor of awakening is dependent on seclusion, dependent on dispassion, dependent on cessation, and results in letting go. So the asavas, vexation and fever that would arise if we were not to develop these qualities do not arise for one when they develop them. These are called the asavas to be abandoned by developing. And for anyone who's so inclined, you can uh, check down in the dialogue box beneath the YouTube video and see a link to this discourse. Uh, so the framework which the Buddha um, chooses to use in this discourse for what it means to develop is what's called the seven factors of awakening, the bojanga, the unga, the factors or the constituent parts which lead to uh, bodhi, which lead to awakening, which lead to enlightenment, those things which lead to uh, clear knowing and uh, appreciation of the way that things are. And these are seven, as you just heard, there is the factor of awakening of mindfulness, of investigation of dhammas, of rapture, of energy, of rapture, of tranquility, 
of concentration and of equanimity. And a unique um, angle which the Buddha uses here is he doesn't just list those seven factors of awakening. He also includes, he um, modifies them or he uh, elaborates on them by uh, pointing to uh, the aspect which includes and is dependent on four qualities, which are seclusion, dispassion, cessation, and which result in letting go. So uh, yeah, these are four, you can think of them as satellite uh, textures or satellite flavors for each of these seven factors of enlightenment. Um, yeah, it's not necessarily enough that our, our mindfulness is mindfulness alone. Uh, we want to be cultivating and practicing the factor of awakening, which is imbued with uh, seclusion, dispassion, cessation, and results in letting go. Uh, so it's good to, uh, it's useful to examine each one of these terms uh, in sequence because each four are used to modify each of the seven factors of awakening. Uh, so these four flavors go along with the, the different factors of awakening. So what does it mean that, uh, for example, the first factor of awakening mindfulness, what does it mean when it is uh, dependent on seclusion or imbibe, when it imbibes, when it uh, is imbued with, with seclusion? Uh, the Pali term is viveka. The Pali term is viveka and there are uh, yeah, range of applications for this term viveka. There's bodily viveka, bodily seclusion, which the Buddha did praise. Uh, so this is the type of mindfulness which is uh, which we cultivate when we go on retreat. Uh, the uh, inward looking, which uh, is is separate from uh, the group of people, from uh, from yeah larger larger society. But then there's also more subtle forms of seclusion. There's chitta viveka, or the seclusion of mind. And what we're looking to uh, practice with this seclusion of mind is the inner space of seclusion, the inner uh, spaciousness, the inner, um, yeah, the mind that can disconnect, the mind that can uh, look on as an observer, as an, as an eyewitness, and isn't so involved and overly uh, wound up with all the dramas and narratives that we uh, tell ourselves and, and create for ourselves. Um, that's what uh, seclusion of mind involves. And then there's upadi viveka, or the uh, seclusion of mind, which is thoroughly uh, un, ungrasp, ungrasping. Um, so we want to ground all of our cultivation of these factors of awakening in, the, in this, this flavor of seclusion. So yeah, what does it mean? And this is a question you can ask yourself. What does it mean to, uh, to be secluded? How can I practice mindfulness uh, right here, right now, regardless of whether or not I'm in a group of people or I'm by myself or whatever situation I find myself in, how can I, uh, what does it mean to uh, have a degree of remoteness? Um, so yeah, something to, to look into. And there are practices to, to cultivate, to cultivate this, uh, ability to watch, this ability to know, to be the knower, to be that which knows. This was a teaching which Ajahn Chah would often use, and many teachers in the Thai forest tradition, be the puru, the one who knows. And what it takes to be the one who knows is uh, a level of viveka, a level of seclusion. So 
so that which can kind of observe what's going on in your body, in your speech, in your mind from a higher vantage point. Then all of these factors of awake, uh, awakening are grounded and rooted in dispassion, in viraga. So uh, to cultivate this capacity for, for knowing, this capacity for uh, being the one who knows, it does degree, it does uh, necessitate a degree of dispassion. So if we're completely um, impassioned, if we're completely uh, burning and enthralled with whatever is going on around us, whatever uh, sights or smells or, or thoughts, if we're just completely embroiled and uh, really burning in a sense, or really kind of heated with, uh, yeah, whatever our, our current fascination and obsession is, then that's the opposite of dispassion. Um, and when we're in that state of being swirled around with the, the eddies and the whirlpools and being completely consumed in the, the flames of our own creation, uh, we just don't see, we don't see things clearly. Uh, so we need to cultivate and practice dispassion and uh, the English term uh, to be passionate about something. Um, yeah, that's, I think there is a place for being passionate about certain things in a Buddhist context. You can be passionate about practicing meditation. You can be passionate about uh, generosity. You can be passionate about uh, wanting to be a good parent or a good friend or uh, a good teacher or a good um, child and be passionate about your work. And that's not necessarily a bad thing if you do it from a place of, uh, of viraga, of, of dispassion. So be, <laughs> have passion for what's worthy of being passionate about, but do it in a, a dispassionate way. Yeah. So uh, this really uh, circles, or as we use in the satellite metaphor, this uh, really rotates and is in sync with uh, this, the first flavor of seclusion. So we're secluded and dispassionate. We're not uh, leaning to the left. We're not leaning to the right. We're not going towards thoughts of the past or uh, predictions about the future. We're not totally restless. We're not totally uh, apathetic and dull and drowsy. Uh, we are, we're present, yeah, in a way which is cool. That's what, uh, that's what it means to, to know this dispassionate and to have this flavor of dispassion and viraga. Uh, viraga is in fact a synonym which the Buddha uses for Nibbana. So awakening, enlightenment is dispassionate. It is a state which is thoroughly cool. Yeah. The next quality, the next flavor, which circles around the seven factors of awakening is cessation or niroda. Um, I was recently trying to implement a practice of every hour, and you know, no matter what I'm doing throughout my day, formal meditation, study, informal meditation, conversation, just take a minute, one, literally one minute, to come back to the breath, 10 breaths. Can I stay with 10 breaths in a row? And I've got a, a particular way that I do that. Uh, involving mantra practice, but just one minute, 10 breaths. Uh, can I come back to this, this place of, uh, of yeah, dispassionate and secluded knowing every hour? Yeah. Have a, an alarm that goes off every hour and it is difficult. And if you were to try it, I am sure you would experience the same thing. We just have so much momentum. We just build up so much 
force. We're just constantly going forward. We just constantly have this agenda that we're, we're pushing on into the future. And, uh, it, it's, it's set, it's, we've set something in, in motion yeah, with all of our, uh, plans for, for who knows how long. And that's literally the poly root, uh, road literally means to roll. Yeah. So V is a, um, uh, a prefix, which implies, uh, an, an action, which is going against. So that, which is going against the role. Yeah. So this is what it means to, to cease. Yeah. We've set the ball rolling down the hill and, uh, we don't know how to, how to, how to stop it, but it's not the best metaphor because uh, with the mind, we can disengage. It's like uh, shifting your car into to neutral. Yeah, we, we can disengage. We can know this cessation even as the momentum continues to go. And this is something we're trying to, to practice and something which we're trying to know the flavor of. And these first three qualities, these first three flavors really complement one another. It's like uh, we want to balance the flavors as a, as a good cook does. You add different spices to uh, make the overall flavor of your dish as robust and pleasing and as complementary as possible. So seclusion, dispassion, cessation, uh, we want to know these in every moment of our practice. We want to develop them in every moment of our practice. And the follow the final flavor, which the Buddha recommends that we imbibe all of our, uh, imbue all of our factors of awakening with is that of resulting in letting go. So we want to practice a way of knowing a way of developing the mind, which leads to letting go. Uh, Joseph Goldstein has a great quote that uh, there is um, I'm going to paraphrase. Uh, basically, there is nothing which does not deserve to be let go. Uh, and that's a, a specific use of, of letting go. We need to you know, accept the responsibilities that we've taken on in our lives and expect, accept responsibility and take responsibility for our way of practice. But uh, at the same time, we need to be able to let go. We need to hold, hold things in a way which is spacious. So these are the flavors which uh, we want our factors of awakening to, uh, to possess. And those factors of awakening are mindfulness. So what is the mindfulness which is secluded, which is dispassionate, which knows the ability to stop and which results in letting go. That's the first factor of awakening. That is what helps us to know awakening in the present and will lead us on to the highest awakening lead us to Nibbana. Uh, there is the factor of awakening. The second one, which is Dhamma Vichya, which is exploration of the Dhamma exploration of, uh, it can be either seen as the Dhamma capital D, uh, investigation of the Buddhist teachings or investigation of Dhamma little D or just phenomena, just looking at our experience, in terms of not self, in terms of impermanence, in terms of the unsatisfactory nature of things. Uh, that's what it means to investigate. And vichya is actually related to, to thinking, the, the way that we think. And can we do that in a way which is secluded and is dispassionate and knows how to stop and can stop on a dime and just be present with all the, the flurry that's going on and which leads to release. The next factor is which we're developing. So is to abandon the asabas is 
that of energy. And how do we put forth energy so that it leads to awakening? How do we uh, bring energy to this present moment so that it is secluded? What does it mean to uh, no effort remotely and to no effort and to put forth effort in a way which ceases, yeah, which leads to cessation and dispassion. Uh, it's, it almost might seem like an oxymoron to people. How do you become passionate about that which is, di you know, dispassionate? How do you, uh, yeah, put forth effort in a way which, uh, you know, involves cessation? And it's a paradox, and it's a koan to figure out in the present moment, right now, with whatever you're doing. Uh, the fourth factor of awakening is uh, piti or rapture. So we want to know not the rapture of uh, whatever sensual gratification, not the rapture of the roller coaster, um, but the rapture which can appreciate the present moment and is has a place of watching internally. Uh, the rapture which uh, knows how to stop, the rapture which uh, is not inflamed, and the rapture which leads to, to letting go. Um, then there is the factor of awakening, which is samadhi, or concentration, or uh, collectedness. Um, that's actually preceded by the factor of awakening of tranquility, or pasadi. And with both of these factors, we want to imbue them with those flavors of seclusion and dispassion and cessation and practice them in a way which leads to letting go. And equanimity is the final factor of awakening. And yeah, these factors of awakening are, uh, in one sense, they are purifying the formal practice of meditation or even jhana. So uh, mindfulness is, is present throughout. Mindfulness is something which we uh, always try to practice. And with each of these different seven factors of awakening, which we're developing, uh, we want to practice them in a more and more uh, subtle and more and more uh, self-contained way, basically leading to uh, more and more solid and stable states of mind, which are the jhanas, which are the states of absorption. So, yeah, that was a bit of a, a whirlwind, whirlwind tour of abandoning by, by developing. Uh, we've got the seven factors of awakening and the four flavors of the mind, which are helpful to, to bring to each of these seven factors. And uh, when we do that, each moment, every moment, any moment that you can, then, yeah, it, it leads to abandoning of the unwholesome and to the creation and uh, appreciation of brightness in the present moment. So I think I'll leave the formal talk there and open it up for questions. I think we've only got a few people actively tuning in. So if anyone here is inspired to ask a question, that's great. And if not, then I can elaborate because I realized that I did kind of rush through these, um, through these different factors. Um, you know, thinking about cessation uh, or about dispassion uh, or seclusion, you know, you might have certain images come to your mind. You've got the monk in the forest, you know, totally, totally calm and totally pacific. Uh, and that there is, there is that aspect of things, but, um, yeah, all of these factors of awakening and all of the, the four flavors of these factors of awakening, uh, can be known by anyone as you're rushing about the state of the body, whether 
it's moving quickly or moving slowly, yeah, there can be an appreciation of uh, yeah, present moment clarity. It just takes a shift of attention and it's, it's something that you have to, to, to practice at. Um, You might be wondering, uh, how does one practice this? Um, although it can be practiced uh, in daily life, uh, there is the cultivation of it in the in meditation as well. And one way to do that is uh, as you're sitting meditation, eyes closed or open. really just turning the light around or uh, looking inwards, um, trying to find that which knows. These are all uh, phrasings which different Buddhist lineages, different Buddhist traditions use to, to get at the same thing. Uh, in There's a type of uh, meditation which is focused, focus mindfulness. Uh, there's investigative mindfulness or investigative meditation. Uh, and then there's more um, yeah, appreciative meditation. And with the focused awareness, that's maybe what most people are used to in Dhamma circles in America. And that's when you are paying attention to a specific object like the breath. But with this way of knowing, it's, uh, it's not object-based. You're uh, just coming to appreciate and listen and tune in inwardsly and figure out that which is noting. Yeah. So I might say a few more words on this in a bit, but maybe go to one question. So thank you for teaching today. I'm very new to these concepts, and this is my first time watching but I'm interested in hearing more about the paradox of Viraga being passionate with dispassion. Yeah, it is, it is a paradox. Um, it is a, a question. Um, it's referred to it earlier as a koan, which is a, a Japanese word for basically a present moment riddle, which is meant to bring you back to right now. And yeah, how do you be passionate? <laughs> how do you be dispassionate? Uh, while you're still passionate about something. And um, yeah, this is, I guess, we can think of it in terms of metaphor. So uh, there are metaphors in terms of just posture. So as you're sitting meditation, you want to be sitting upright, you want to be alert, you want to be awake. And how that manifests in bodily posture is uh, with the spine, basically each of the vertebrae well stacked one upon the other, and your head being pulled up as if by a string. And that is uh, the generative that can be conceived of as being the, the generative aspect or yeah, the element of passion in our lives, that which we uh, give ourselves to, that which uh, pulls us up and which draws us, uh, keeps us awake. But at the same time, uh, that needs to be balanced with uh, the firm groundedness of, of the posture. So Although we do feel as if we're, you know, slightly pulling up, remembering the force of levity. Uh, at the same time, we need to be grounded. So how that manifests is remembering to breathe into your stomach, you know, remembering to have a solid base of how you're sitting with your knees on the ground, perhaps with your uh, sitz bone, S-I-T-Z 
your coccyx slightly lifted, and that way you can be both grounded, firm, balanced, but at the same time awake. So that's uh, that groundedness can be thought of as the dispassionate. Yeah. So we've got that which is passionate, which is uh, won't even not even talking here about um, the problematic aspects of uh, of craving and of passion, but talking about the the wholesome aspects of uh, yeah being passionate about good things and worthy causes. Uh, balance that with the groundedness. Okay, we don't jump forward, latch on to the future, we don't fall back, and then we just stay not thoroughly, uh, thoroughly uplifted or thoroughly uh, displaced by, by our passion, thoroughly uh, engulfed in, in the flames of the passion. Hopefully that's helpful talking in, in metaphors as a postural metaphors as a way of conceiving of this mental stance or the mental space of sitting. Okay. Hello. So the question, hello. And thank you. Would you consider the paradox of being passionate about dispassion uh, as a type of vibration? Um, I think it can manifest as a type of vibration. So uh, that that state of uh, stillness within the movement, that state of being uh, yeah, not moved while you're moving, that state of uh, knowing dispassion while you're uh, expressing wholesome passions, uh, it can be experienced with um, a, a greater appreciation of what's called the nada sound or the uh, the inner inner sound or um, yeah the slight buzzing in the ear uh, which one can hear when one uh, pays attention to it. So this kind of uh, oral a u r l vibration is is one way of conceiving of the nada sound and i think that does the uh it, it doesn't necessarily have to correlate you don't have to be paying attention to the uh, the sound of silence the nada sound at the same time that you're knowing this balanced state of uh of flow this balanced state of non-movement within movement but that's so that's one way that vibration manifests in this uh, this flowing uh, appreciation. Um, and yeah, I think maybe more than it being a, uh, a type of vibration itself, I think it allows you to tune into vibrations which, which already exist within your body. So when you're no longer shooting out of your eyes and shooting out of your mouth and letting the mind just leak out of your ears and following whatever uh, thought comes to mind when you're still and content and steady in the present moment, then you can appreciate the vibrations uh, which are already experiencing in the body. So, and that is one manifestation or one uh, aspect of anicca or impermanence. So right now, if you're in the present moment, if you're embodied, you can feel what your hands feel like. What do your palms feel like right now? That's vibratory. That's, uh, yeah, you have to be in the present moment to, to know this sensation. The body is only here right now. It's not in the future. It's not in the past. So uh, in that sense, yeah, the uh, dispassionate and, um, yeah, secluded mind, which is content within, uh, does have a greater appreciation of vibrations. So hope that's helpful. Um, yeah, I think that's the end of the formal questions for today, but it's lovely being here with everyone. And, um, 
Yeah, I, I personally find that when talking Dhamma or trying to explain Dhamma, um, it can uh, actually engender these inner, uh, this inner listening, this inner uh, attempt to return to balance. And it doesn't have to be teaching or talking about anything specifically Dhamma wise, but uh, in your relationships with other people, how can you know the, how can you be dispassionate, you know, while still being passionate? How can you know a place of seclusion while still being engaged? Um, yeah, it's possible to do while you're engaging with people, whether online or in person. So I'll end this morning's reflections there and hope everybody has a great day and maybe we'll see you later. Okay, thanks everybody.